One mistake the Constitution didn't make was to mandate that the federal government pay all its debts only in gold. Then we would have wound up with the same system that had caused the revolution in the first place. It does mandate that for state governments, but that has never been adhered to. All the Constitution had to do was to mandate that only Congress could issue the nation's money, debt-free, just like most people think happens today. This defect in the Constitution left the door wide open for bankers to ram a bill through Congress in 1791, four years after the Constitution had been signed, to turn over creation of the nation's money to private bankers once again. Like all the privately owned central banks that would follow, the new bank was given a name that would deceive people into thinking it was part of the U.S. government, but it was not. It was called the First Bank of the United States. This is actually the original building here in Philadelphia. After a contentious debate, Congress finally granted the new bank a 20-year charter, a private monopoly. Again, the nation's money would be created out of thin air by the new bank and loaned to the government and to private individuals, all at interest, just as our money supply is created today. So, if there was $100 million worth of money in the economy, there would be $100 million worth of national debt. Debt the citizens and their children would have to pay interest on by taxation. And so it is today. The national debt is roughly the same as the national money supply. As Secretary of State, Jefferson watched the borrowing with sadness and frustration, unable to stop it. I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution, taking from the federal government the power of borrowing. Although Jefferson served two terms as president from 1801 to 1809, nothing was done until the bank's charter came up for renewal in 1811. The press openly attacked the bank, calling it a great swindle. Some writers have claimed that the head of the Bank of England warned that the United States would find itself involved in a most disastrous war if the bank's charter were not renewed. After another contentious debate, the bank's renewal bill was defeated by a single vote in Congress. Within five months, the War of 1812 was on. In 1813, Jefferson wrote to his son-in-law, John Epps, Although we have so foolishly allowed the power of issuing our own debt-free money to be filched from us by private individuals, I think we may recover it. The state should be asked to transfer the right of issuing paper money to Congress in perpetuity. Jefferson had it exactly right. Congress and only Congress should have the right to issue America's paper money and at no interest to no one. In 1814, the British successfully attacked Washington and burned the White House and the Capitol. After the conclusion of the War of 1812, the very next year, the bankers were back trying to get Congress to reinstate their precious privately owned central bank. Jefferson lashed out in a letter to then Treasury Secretary Gallatin. The Treasury, lacking confidence in the country, delivered itself bound hand and foot to bold and bankrupt bankers pretending to have money, whom it could have crushed at any moment. But despite Jefferson's protests, in 1816, Congress passed a bill giving another 20-year charter to a new privately owned central bank, the second bank of the United States. Once again, the English debt money system was back in control of America. It was almost like the revolution had never happened. But then the bankers ran headlong into old hickory, Andrew Jackson. By 1828, opponents of the bank nominated Senator Andrew Jackson of Tennessee, the hero of the final battle of the War of 1812, to run for president. The banks poured millions into Jackson's defeat, but to no avail. The American people were fed up with the privately owned central bank and wanted out. Jackson was swept into office. In 1832, with Jackson's re-election approaching, the bank tried to have their charter renewed early in the hopes that Jackson wouldn't want the controversy of a fight with bankers just before the election. They were wrong. Although Congress passed the renewal bill, Jackson vetoed it. 
His veto message drew a direct line between the bank and its masters in the Bank of England. It is easy to conceive that great evils to our country and its institutions might flow from such a concentration of power in the hands of a few who are irresponsible to the people. Controlling our currency, receiving our public monies, and holding thousands of our citizens in dependence would be more formidable and dangerous than a military power of the enemy. Nicholas Biddle was head of the Second Bank of the United States. He was brazen with the financial power he wielded over the nation. He even threatened to cause a depression if Jackson's veto were not overturned. Nothing but widespread suffering will produce any effect on Congress. Our only safety is in pursuing a steady course of firm monetary restriction. And I have no doubt that such a course will ultimately lead to restoration of the currency and the recharter of the bank. Biddle made good on his threat. America was quickly plunged into a deep depression. Property was foreclosed on for pennies on the dollar. Jackson responded forcefully. You are a den of vipers. I intend to rout you out. And by the eternal God, I will rout you out. Eventually, the nation's newspapers sided with Jackson and the bank was not rechartered. Jackson then set about paying off the national debt, a debt caused by the government borrowing the nation's money supply into existence. Jackson was the only president who ever paid off the national debt. A few weeks later, an assassin tried to shoot President Jackson. He stuck two pistols in the stomach, but both misfired. Jackson solemnly warned the nation about any future attempts to establish another privately owned central bank. The bold effort the present bank had made to control the government, the distress it had wantonly produced are but premonitions of the fate that awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. Jackson went through essentially a multi-year war trying to get rid of the Second Bank of the United States. He ultimately won that war. He believed that the bankers of the time were extremely destructive to the commonwealth of the United States and that their policies were essentially to cause inflation in various asset classes and then cause deflation and wipe out everybody who was in debt. It's, it's a pattern that is repeated throughout history. After the Revolutionary War, Great Britain sent some of their bankers over here to try to bribe Congress to get us onto a single metallic standard for the same purpose, because they control the gold supply. And if you control the quantity of the money, nobody else cares about anything else. You can cause depressions, deflation, inflation, anytime you'd like, for your own political and monetary benefit. And that if you can give people cheap credit that they cannot afford, human nature is, is that people will take whatever you give them for free, okay? Whether it ultimately destroys them or not. And so you can create these boom and bust cycles that ultimately asset strip the wealth of average people. Jackson got us out of debt, but 25 years later, Abraham Lincoln would do even more, return to government-issued debt-free money. He called them greenbacks, the inspiration for the Emerald City of Oz. The bankers were still angry about Jackson killing the Second Bank of the United States 25 years earlier. Since then, America's economy had boomed, a bad example for the rest of the world. America had to be stopped, so they devised a plan to split the rich new nation, divide and conquer by war. As Chancellor of Germany Otto von Bismarck put it in 1876, I know of absolute certainty that the division of the United States into two federations of equal force was decided long before the Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. These bankers were afraid that the United States, if they remained as one bloc and were to develop as one nation, would attain economic and financial independence, which would upset the domination of Europe over the world. President Jackson saw this coming as well. In his farewell address back on March 4th, 1837, he warned the nation. Have designs already been formed to sever the Union 
this great and glorious republic would soon be broken into a multitude of petty states, without commerce, without credit, loaded with taxes to pay armies, trampled upon by the nations of Europe. The bankers figured that no matter what the outcome, a war between North and South would leave America so financially strapped that the entire Western Hemisphere would once again be opened to colonization. Standing directly in the way was the newly elected President Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln evaded assassins in Baltimore in February of 1861 on his way to his inauguration in Washington on March 4th. The very next month, the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, after seven southern states seceded from the Union. Soon thereafter, France invaded Mexico and stationed troops along the southern border of the U.S. Great Britain moved 11,000 troops into Canada and positioned them along America's northern border. The two longtime European enemies were ready to fight over the scraps that their central bankers were about to make of the American experiment in freedom. Lincoln was in a classic double bind. No matter what he did, he was being forced into a war by the hidden hands behind the financial curtain. He agonized over the fate of the Union, sensing it was only through the strength of Union that the financial powerhouses of Europe could be held at bay. In 1861, Lincoln went to New York to apply for the necessary war loans from what he hoped were patriotic American bankers. But the bankers saw him coming and knew that the plan was to split the country in two. And so there was a high probability that Lincoln's government would default on any loans. Consequently, they demanded an interest rate of as much as 36%. Lincoln returned to Washington depressed. Then Lincoln came up with the most brilliant idea of his presidency. He decided to return to America's colonial monetary roots, have the government issue their own money. So that is exactly what Lincoln did. From 1862 to 1865, he printed $450 million of the new bills, which he called U.S. notes. To distinguish them from debt-based money, he had them printed in green ink on the back with a red seal on the front. That's why the notes were called greenbacks. Since Congress had declared greenbacks to be legal tender for all debts, Lincoln was able to pay his troops and buy their supplies with this new money, all created at no interest to the federal government. As MIT professor Dr. Davis Rich Dewey would write 40 years later in his Financial History of the United States. The underlying idea in the greenback philosophy is that the issue of currency is a function of the government, a sovereign right which ought not to be delegated to corporations. On April 14, 1865, 41 days after his second inauguration and five days after the end of the Civil War, Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. The Chancellor of Germany, Otto von Bismarck, lamented the death of Abraham Lincoln. The death of Lincoln was a disaster for the world. There was no man great enough to wear his boots. I fear that foreign bankers, with their torturous tricks, will entirely control the exuberant riches of America and use it systematically to corrupt modern civilization. They will not hesitate to plunge the whole world into wars and chaos in order that the earth should become their inheritance. Ten years after Lincoln's death, Bismarck himself narrowly escaped an assassination attempt in 1875. After the death of President Lincoln, the bankers began to reassert their control over America's money. This was no easy task. Lincoln's greenbacks, just like Rome's plentiful debt-free coins and England's debt-free tally sticks, were generally popular, and their existence had let the genie out of the bottle. The public was becoming accustomed to debt-free money. Popular songs sang the greenbacks' praises. On April 12, 1866, Congress passed the Contraction Act authorizing the Secretary of the Treasury to begin to retire the greenbacks in circulation and to contract the money supply. Authors Ted Thorne and Richard Warner explained the results of the money contraction in their book on the subject, The Truth in Money Book. 
The hard times which occurred after the Civil War could have been avoided if the Greenback legislation had continued as President Lincoln had intended. Instead, there were a series of money panics, what we call recessions, which put pressure on Congress to enact legislation to place the banking system under centralized control. In 1866, there was $1.8 billion in currency in circulation in the United States, about $50.46 per capita. In 1867 alone, $500 million was removed from the U.S. money supply. Ten years later, in 1876, America's money supply was reduced to only $600 million. In other words, two-thirds of America's money had been called in by the bankers. Incredibly, only $14.60 per capita remained in circulation. What's so important about how money was withdrawn from the U.S. money supply? Because this is the real cause of depressions, deliberate manipulations of the money supply by big bankers to get what they want politically. The very thing King Henry was trying to put a stop to when he created tally sticks in 1100 A.D. Ten years later, the money supply had been further reduced to only $400 million, even though the population had boomed. The result was that only $6.67 per capita remained in circulation, an 84% decline in just 20 years. The people suffered terribly in a protracted, severe depression. Now, let's put these percentage figures into perspective. On January 28, 2009, the world's business and government leaders met in Davos, Switzerland at the annual World Economic Forum, which they optimistically titled, Shaping the Post-Crisis World, as though someone had already fixed the problem. According to Reuters, the world's largest news service, the world's money supply had nearly been cut in half in the previous 15 months. 40% of the world's wealth was destroyed in the last five quarters. It is an almost incomprehensible number. And how does that compare to the Great Depression of the 1930s? Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman put it this way in his 1996 interview with National Public Radio. The Federal Reserve definitely caused the Great Depression by contracting the amount of currency in circulation by one-third from 1929 to 1933. In other words, by January of 2009, the world's money supply had been contracted more than that which caused the Great Depression in America in the 1930s. Some believe the economic crisis that began in 2008 is still being completely manipulated by the big banks. But it is more likely that their debt money system has finally spiraled out of even their control. In 2008 and 2009, nations poured unprecedented money into the system to prevent its collapse. At the very least, unprecedented inflation will surely follow. After Lincoln's death, the big bankers began returning America to the yellow brick road of financial serfdom. But first, they had to get rid of the silver slippers. But the bankers were not done bringing post-Civil War America to its knees. They wanted to take all silver money out of the system and make only gold be money. In 1872, a British banker named Ernest Said was given 100,000 pounds, about $5 million in today's money, by the Bank of England and sent to America to bribe the necessary congressman to get silver demonetized to further reduce the money supply. The Bank of England wanted America's money in their control, and what better way to achieve that than mandating a gold-only money system? The next year, Congress passed the Coinage Act of 1873, and the minting of silver dollars abruptly stopped. Newspapers derided the act as the crime of 73. Everybody knew about it. The average American hated it. Demonetizing silver made money even more scarce. It put the bankers, who were the primary holders of gold, in even greater control of America. It's been a puzzle to a lot of economic historians, this obsession with uh, keeping the amount of currency so strictly limited. Um, 
it didn't seem to comport with the expanding economy of the time. You have this rapidly expanding economy. You have immigration that imparts fueling it. You have westward expansion. You have new industries, new technologies. And yet you have a restricted money supply, which makes it increasingly difficult for people to uh, engage in consumption and purchases and uh, other types of economic activity. By 1873, L. Frank Baum was just 17 years old, but he was already publishing a local newspaper in his hometown of Chittenango, New York. By 1877, the nation was in an uproar over the hated crime of 73. Riots broke out from Pittsburgh to Chicago. The torches of starving vandals lit up the sky. The bankers huddled to decide on their next move. They decided to hang tough. At the 1877 meeting of the American Bankers Association, the ABA, they urged their membership to do everything in their power to put down the notion of a return to greenbacks. The ABA secretary, James Buell, authored a letter to the members that blatantly called on the banks to subvert not only Congress, but the press. It is advisable to do all in your power to sustain such prominent daily and weekly newspapers, especially the agricultural and religious press, as will oppose the greenback issue of paper money. To repeal the act creating banknotes, or to restore to circulation the government issue of money, will be to provide the people with money and will therefore seriously affect our individual profits as bankers and lenders. See your congressman at once and engage him to support our interest that we may control legislation. Political parties advocating a return to greenback money sprang up and ran candidates for Congress and President. In the 1878 elections, 21 independents were swept into Congress, mostly greenbackers. Two years later, in 1880, the American people elected General James Garfield president. Garfield understood how the economy was being manipulated. As a congressman, he had been chairman of the Appropriations Committee and was a member of the Banking and Currency Committee. Garfield understood the ability of the very wealthy to manipulate gold money. He investigated the cause of the Black Friday gold market scandal of 1869 when financier Jay Gould and others cornered the gold market causing wild fluctuations in the price. This is a photograph of the actual quote board from the New York Gold Trading Room, which Garfield introduced as evidence during a congressional investigation the following year. This is Garfield's handwriting. After his inauguration, he slammed the money changers publicly in 1881. Whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. And when you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled, one way or another, by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. Garfield understood, perhaps only coincidentally, however, within a few weeks of making this statement on July 2nd, 1881, President Garfield was assassinated. After Garfield's assassination, the depression deepened, leaving the unemployed to face poverty and starvation. Produce was left to rot in the fields. The country was facing poverty amidst plenty because there was insufficient money in circulation to keep the wheels of trade turning. The country sorely needed the sort of liquidity urged by Lincoln and the greenbackers, but the bankers insisted that allowing the government to print its own money would be dangerously inflationary. That was their argument, but critics called it humbuggery. The big bankers finally had complete control of the money supply again by killing off the last competitor to their yellow brick road. Now they had to hold on against the rising anger of the average American. In 1888, L. Frank Baum moved his family to Aberdeen, Dakota Territory to open a general store. 
Baum sympathized with the local farmers hard hit by the combination of scarce money and a severe drought. Unfortunately, he got so deeply in debt that the bank foreclosed on the store. In 1890, Baum, at age 34, started a local newspaper. It was an election year and politics was a hot topic in the Midwest. The 1890 congressional elections were a landslide for the Democratic Party. Only 300 miles south of Aberdeen, South Dakota, in Omaha, Nebraska, one of the newly elected congressmen was William Jennings Bryan, the man who would become known as the Lion of the Free Silver Movement. A few years later, L. Frank Baum would closely follow the meteoric career of Bryan and even create the character of the Cowardly Lion to symbolize his political career. The year 1890 saw no economic relief in Dakota Territory, so Baum's newspaper folded at the end of the year. In 1891, Baum moved his family to Chicago, where he took a job at the Chicago Evening Post. Meanwhile, back on the national front, the bankers were ready to unleash additional monetary restrictions. Their methods and motives were laid out with shocking clarity in a memo sent out by the American Bankers Association, the ABA, in 1891. Notice that this memo called for bankers to create a depression on a certain date three years in the future. Here's how it read in part. Note the telling reference to England, home of the mother bank. On September 1st, 1894, we will not renew our loans under any consideration. On September 1st, we will demand our money. We will foreclose and become mortgagees in possession. We can take two-thirds of the farms west of the Mississippi and thousands of them east of the Mississippi as well at our own price. Then the farmers will become tenants as in England. The next year, a leaflet known as the Panic Circular was issued by the American Bankers Association and was subsequently published in many newspapers. It urged all national banks throughout the United States to help deepen the money panic. Silver, silver certificates and treasury bonds, that is to say all the government's money, must be retired and interest-bearing national bank notes made the only money. You will at once retire one-third of your circulation, your paper money, and call in one-half of your loans. Be careful to make a monetary emergency among your patrons, especially among influential businessmen. The future of our debt-based money system depends upon immediate action, as there is an increasing sentiment in favor of government legal tender notes and silver coinage. The Depression actually began in 1893 with what historians now call the Panic of 1893. It all started when European investors demanded payment only in gold, draining gold reserves in the U.S. Again, America was being forced by the Europeans onto a gold-only money system. The results were as inevitable as before. A deep depression quickly set in as the major holders of gold in Europe choked the life out of the American economy. In total, over 15,000 companies and 500 banks failed, most of them in the West. Unemployment skyrocketed 600 percent, up to over 18 percent nationwide by 1894. With the winter of 1894 coming on, untold thousands of farms were foreclosed on. As a result, many families had to walk away from recently built homes. It's said that the image of the vacant Victorian haunted house originated from this era. These depressions could be controlled fairly easily with America on the gold standard, and the banks own most of the gold. Since gold is scarce, it is one of the easiest commodities to manipulate. People wanted silver money legalized again so they could escape the stranglehold the money changers had on gold-backed money. People wanted silver money reinstated, reversing Mr. Said's Act of 1873, by then called the Crime of 73. Bankers and uh, financial institutions tended to oppose silver as part of the backing of the currency. They didn't have control over the mining and production of silver in the West, and without uh, that control, 
they couldn't have the overall control they liked over, over the currency. Most monetary reform advocates today argue that the solution to our current economic woes is a return to a gold standard. This would require that our money be backed by a certain percentage of gold. Interestingly, they used the same terms that bankers of the late 19th century used. They called gold-backed money honest money and constitutional money. I, I worked for a gold dealer for a short time. And I would sit there in a room with 40 people calling and trying to sell gold all day long on the phone. And every one of them was telling them, get rid of that worthless money and buy the good money. Then it comes to the end of the month and every one of them walked into the office and wanted the bad money for, in the, in their, for their pay. As the depression deepened and big banks continued to buy up farmers' foreclosed properties, a lion emerged out of Nebraska to try to break their deadly chokehold on the American economy. 1896 was a pivotal year in American history. L. Frank Baum was now living in Chicago and deeply interested in politics. But to make a living for his wife and four children, he worked as a traveling salesman. When he was home, he was writing his first children's stories. On the political front, the presidential campaign of 1896 would see the explosive money issue dominate the election. The farmers of the West were sick and tired of the bankers not lending out their gold money. In fact, most of the money that was still in circulation was about $300 million worth of Lincoln's old greenbacks. A virtually unknown former congressman from Nebraska, William Jennings Bryan, ran for president as a Democrat and embraced the free silver issue which the Populist Party had unsuccessfully tried earlier. Bryan's father had been an ardent greenbacker. The New York bankers were well aware of the anger and tried to control the 1896 Democratic Convention. An article said to have been published in a banker's magazine of 1892 shows not only their attempts to manipulate the politics of the day, but also their deep contempt for the average American voter whom they refer to as the inferior social stratum of society. We must go forward cautiously and consolidate each acquired position because already the inferior social stratum of society is giving unceasing signs of agitation. Let us make use of the courts when through the law's intervention the common people shall have lost their homes, they will be more easy to control and more easy to govern, and they shall not be able to resist the strong hand of the government acting in accordance with the control of the leaders of finance. As the quote continues, notice how they try to manipulate the population into focusing on diversionary political issues. We must keep the people busy with political antagonisms. We will therefore speed up the question of reform of tariffs within the Democratic Party, and will put the spotlight on the question of protection for the Republican Party. By dividing the electorate this way, we'll be able to have them spend their energies at struggling amongst themselves on questions that for us have no importance whatsoever. Now let's return to the 1896 Democratic Convention. The issues were remarkably similar. William Jennings Bryan represented the embodiment of all the Democrats' wrath against the gold money system. At the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1896, Bryan made an emotional speech entitled, Crown of Thorns and Cross of Gold. Bryan's speech was so powerful that it propelled him from relative obscurity to the presidential nomination on the fifth ballot at the tender age of 36. Amazingly, we have Bryan's actual voice recreating portions of this famous speech recorded years later with the advent of recording technology. Although the recording does not capture the power of the original moment, it does allow us to hear Brian's voice. I come to speak to you in the defense of a cause as holy as the cause of liberty, the cause of humanity. Never before in the history of this country has there been witnessed such a contest as that through which we have just passed. Brian's recreation recording then skips significant portions of his original speech. According to the official proceedings of the Democratic National Convention, Bryan continued with these important references to America's monetary history. 
What we need is an Andrew Jackson to stand as Jackson stood against the encroachments of aggregated wealth. We say in our platform that we believe that the right to coin money and issue money is a function of government. We believe it. We believe it is a part of sovereignty. Those who are opposed to this proposition tell us that the issue of paper money is a function of the bank and that the government ought to go out of the banking business. I stand with Jefferson rather than with them and tell them as he did that the issue of money is a function of the government and that the banks should go out of the governing business. Remember the 1892 memo from the Bankers Magazine which bragged that they would try to busy the Democrats with the tariff issue? Here's where Brian refers to that very issue. They ask why it is we say more on the money question than we say upon the tariff question. I reply that if protection has slain its thousands, the gold standard has slain its tens of thousands. When we have restored the money of the Constitution, all other necessary reforms will be possible, and that until that is done, there is no reform that can be accomplished. However, the gold standard and its 30-year-long restriction on the money supply had become so unpopular that even most Republicans had come out against it. Now, Brian's recording picks back up. They will search the pages of history in vain to find a single instance where the common people of any land have ever declared themselves in favor of the gold standard. They can find where the holders of fixed investments have declared for a gold standard, but not for the masses have. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. The bankers were scared. The average American farmer was mad about the lack of a plentiful money supply. Now it looked like they had finally gained sufficient political force to win the highest office in the land and disrupt all the bankers' plans. As a result, the 1896 campaign was among the most fiercely contested presidential races in American history. Though Bryan was only 36 years old at the time, this speech is widely regarded as the most famous oration ever made before a political convention. The McKinley campaign outspent Bryan by a five to one margin. Bryan's strategy was to take his political campaign on the road. Bryan invented the national stumping tour. He made over 500 speeches in 27 states during the four-month campaign, an average of four a day, many of them lasting over two hours. Across the nation, tens of thousands of Americans rallied around Bryan's appearances with torchlight parades. L. Frank Baum's own son wrote that Baum marched in more than one torchlight parade for Bryan. The battle became so heated that thousands of miles away in Alaska, the highest mountain in North America, Mount McKinley, was even named for Bryan's opponent, Republican William McKinley. It seems that the first gold miner on the mountain, a man named William Dickey, named the mountain in honor of the gold money candidate in retaliation because his many silver mining friends so zealously supported William Jennings Bryan. McKinley got manufacturers and industrialists to inform their employees that if Bryan were elected, all factories and plants would close and there would be no work. The ruse succeeded. McKinley beat Bryan by a small margin. Bryan ran for president again in 1900 and in 1908, but fell short each time. But the threat his presence presented to the national bankers afforded the Republican alternatives, Roosevelt and Taft, a measure of independence from the bankers. Roosevelt mildly opposed their monopolies and Taft was unenthusiastic about their proposed central bank legislation that would finally be passed in 1913 as the Federal Reserve Act. The bankers therefore shifted their support to Democrat Woodrow Wilson in 1912. Although William Jennings Bryan never gained the presidency, his efforts delayed the money changers for 20 years from attaining their next goal. 
a new privately owned central bank for America, the Federal Reserve.